Senior High School On Air Academy. Unstoppable! Delivering you quality education amidst pandemic. To be fair, school opening to October 5. Unstoppable! Giving you accessible learning platform anytime, anywhere. A class, whatever form it is. Comprehensible! Pop it up and get yourself ready. I will repeat, and you will do it later on. Accurate! The sphere that includes all living things. Today, we will be talking about rational functions. Simplify! This is Jaw speaking. How may I help you? This at School Radio's Senior High School On Air Academy. And now, here's your new episode for ABC's Top Quality Research. Your guide for the subject, Practical Research 1, ABC's Top Quality Research. Good day, research enthusiasts! Once again, you're tuning in to Radio Escola sa Isabella. I am Teacher Emma Luisa Fernando, your radio teacher for today. Hooray! As we start this episode, let me give you a motivational quote from Charles F. Kettering. Research means that you don't know, but are willing to find out. Thus, we should be inquisitive enough to find out something that tickles our interests. Yay! We're now on our third week, so keep the passion for learning alive, dear learners. Alright! Before we begin, let us have a short recap of what transpired last episode. We'll make it simple. Write yes on your notebook if the statement is true and no if the statement is false. Okay! Number 1. After you have chosen the most appropriate qualitative research method to use, the next step is to identify the participants of your study. Yes or no? Right! It's yes, because you have already identified what research method will you use. In order to continue your study, you should choose next who will be your participants. Number 2. After choosing the participants, sampling procedure is to be decided. Is it a yes or a no? You're right! It's a yes! It is just a continuous process. After deciding on the research method, next in line is to identify the sampling procedure to cater your participants. Number 3. It is advisable to study the entire population of your participants. I'll give you one, two, three. Is it a yes or a no? That's right! It's a no! Because a sample or a representative of the population is only needed in your research study. Great memory learners! I know you're excited for the continuation of our research episode. Oh yeah! Buckle up because we'll continue developing your research papers. We'll be dealing with planning data collection. Utilizing data gathering instrument, analyzing procedures, and presenting written research methodology. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am! Good! But before that, keep tuning in because we'll be back after this reminder. We are in the new normal, let us practice new things. Observe social and physical distancing at all times. Disinfect our things. Let our temperature be checked. Always wash your hands with soap and water. Use hand sanitizers. Avoid crowded places. And always wear your face mask and face shield. Always remember these things because health is well. Let us beat COVID-19. A reminder from the Department of Health, Department of Education, and this is station. Station. 
and we're back, Radio Escuela Learners! Yay! How is the month of May to you? Were you able to achieve your monthly goals? I hope you did! Have you ever investigated something that caught your interest? Like seeing a beautiful place to spend where you plan to spend vacation with your family after this pandemic? What would you do to gather information about the place? I know you have many ways to gather information. Am I right? Oh, yeah! Remember that the 21st century learner is a good researcher. So, let us dig deeper on the steps in data gathering. All right! To successfully conduct your qualitative research, it is important to plan your data gathering. A qualitative researcher may use survey, observation, and interview to collect necessary data. Let me give you terms that will help you complete your Chapter 3. First, we have research instruments. These are instruments that you will use in the study such as surveys, observations, and interviews. Second, data collection procedures. These are specific steps you will undergo in order to collect data for your study. Here, you can mention everything you used and how they were of help in your data collection. Third, data analysis procedures. This describes how you will analyze the data that you will gather. You indicate here what ways and tools you use to analyze each data gathered. This time, let's talk about survey in data collection. What do we mean by survey? Great! Survey means collecting information about a group of people by asking them questions and analyzing the results. It is a flexible method of data collection that can be used in many different types of research and in many different fields. It is a good choice when you want to find out about the characteristics, preferences, opinions, or beliefs of a group of people. Great! Survey means collecting information about a group of people by asking them questions and analyzing the results. It is a flexible method of data collection that can be used in many different types of research and in many different fields. It is a good choice when you want to find out about the characteristics, preferences, opinions, or beliefs of a group of people. Common uses of survey include social research or investigating the experiences and characteristics of different social groups, market research or finding out what customers think about products, services, and companies. Health research or collecting data from patients about symptoms and treatments. Politics or measuring public opinion about parties and policies. And psychology or researching personality traits, preferences, and behaviors. How do we conduct an effective survey? To conduct an effective survey, follow these steps. Step 1. Determine who will participate in the survey. Before you start conducting survey, you should already have a clear research question that defines what you want to find out. Based on this question, you need to determine exactly who you will target to participate in the survey. The target population is the specific group of people that you want to find out about. This group can be very broad or relatively narrow. For example, the population of SDO Isabella learners and grade 11 learners of a certain school. Your survey should aim to produce results that can be generalized to the whole population. That means you need to carefully define exactly who you want to draw conclusions about. Step 2. Decide the type of survey. 
There are two main types of survey. The first one is questionnaire, where a list of questions is distributed by sending out a paper survey by mail to gather demographic information, for example, in a government census of the population. By online platform like using Google Forms and other online platforms, which is very useful nowadays because of the pandemic. Or in person, which you can use if your research focuses on a specific location. You can distribute a written or printed questionnaire to be completed by respondents on the spot, such as approaching or asking students to complete a questionnaire at the end of a class. The second one is interview. Oral interviews are a useful method for smaller sample sizes. They allow you to gather more in-depth information on people's opinions and preferences. Good thing is, you can conduct interview by phone or in person. Step 3. Design the survey questions and layout. You need to decide which questions you will ask and how you will ask them. Of course, the following aspects must be considered. Number 1. The type of questions. Your questions can be closed-ended to give the respondent a predetermined set of answers to choose from. Like in a binary answer such as yes or no, agree or disagree, in a scale like 5-point Likert scale ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. In a list of options with a single answer possible like age, sex, or civil status categories. Close-ended questions are best for quantitative research since they provide you with numerical data that can be statistically analyzed to find patterns, trends, and correlations. How about for open-ended questions? Well, these are best for qualitative research since this type of question has no predetermined answers to choose from. Instead, the respondents answer in their own words. Open-ended questions are most common in interviews, but you can also use them in questionnaires. They are often useful as follow-up questions to ask for more detailed explanations of responses to the closed questions. Number 2 is the content of the survey questions. To ensure the validity and reliability of your results, you need to carefully consider each question in the survey. All questions should be narrowly focused with enough context for the respondent to answer accurately. Also, avoid questions that are not directly relevant to the survey's purpose. Number 3 is phrasing the survey questions. In terms of language, the survey questions should as clear and precise as possible. Tailor the questions to your target population. Keep in mind their level of knowledge of the topic. Use language that respondents will easily understand and avoid words with vague or ambiguous meanings. Additionally, Make sure your questions are phrased neutrally, with no bias towards one answer or another. Number 4 is ordering the survey questions. The questions should be arranged in a logical order. Start with easy, non-sensitive, close-ended questions that will encourage the respondents to continue. If the survey covers several different topics or themes, Group together related questions. You can divide a questionnaire into sections to help respondents understand what is being asked in each part. If a question refers to or depends on the answer to a previous question, it should be placed directly next to one another. Now, we move on to step 4. In this step, distribute the survey and collect responses. Before you start, create a clear plan for where, when, how, and with whom you will conduct the survey. Determine in advance how many responses you require and how you will gain access to the sample. 
when you are satisfied that you have created a strong research design suitable for answering your research questions, you can conduct the survey through your method of choice. May it be via mail, online platform, or in person. Can you still follow, learners? So attentive! Now we go on to step 5. Here, you are tasked to analyze the responses. And there are many methods of analyzing the results of your survey. First, you have to process the data. Usually, with the help of a computer program to sort all the responses. You should also clean the data by removing incomplete or incorrectly completed responses. If you used open-ended questions, you will have to code the responses by assigning labels to each response and organizing them into categories or themes. You can also use more qualitative methods such as thematic analysis, which is especially suitable for analyzing interviews. Statistical analysis is usually conducted using programs like SPSS or simple regression. The same set of survey data can be subject to many analysis. Is that clear, learners? Yes, ma'am! Cool! How about step 6? On this part, write up the results. Finally, when you have collected and analyzed all the necessary data, you will write it up as part of your research paper. In the methodology section, you describe exactly how you conducted the survey. You should explain the types of questions you used, the sampling method, when and where the survey took place, and the response rate. You can include the full questionnaire as an appendix and refer to it in the text if relevant. Then, introduce the analysis by describing how you prepare the data and the statistical methods you used to analyze it. In the results section, you summarize the key results from your analysis. In the discussion and conclusion, you give your explanations and interpretations of these results, answer your research questions, and reflect on the implications and limitations of the research. Alright, how was it? Are you now familiar with how to conduct a survey in your data gathering? You can also consider those steps in conducting other data gathering instruments that we will discuss. Remember what those are? Right, they are observation and interview. Okay then, let us now discuss observation in data collection. Do you know how to observe? Of course, we all do it at some point, correct? In research, observation exhibits the initial data collection from the actual setting using the census. There are research questions that can be answered through observing the actions of the participants. For example, you may observe the attitude of a group of students towards science experiment during an actual experiment. As a researcher, you employ four different types of observation. Any idea what those types are? Fret not because number one is participant observation. It involves an intensive interaction between the researcher and the subjects or participants. This means that as a participant observer, the researcher joins the group he or she is studying in their environment and participate in their activities. Participant observation can be overt and covert. Oops, new words! Want to know their meaning? Sure! Overt participant observation is a type of participant observation wherein the identity of the researcher is known to the group being studied. This means that prior to joining or observing the group, the researcher is likely to inform the members of the group about his or her goal in joining the group and the purpose, scope, and length of the research. Meanwhile, 
Covert participant observation is a type of participant observation, wherein the participants are not aware of the identity of the researcher nor that they are being observed for research. This method allows a researcher to gain access to groups that would not normally allow themselves to be studied and to obtain a richer and more detailed observation. Number two, we have non-participant observation. This is where the researcher does not participate in the activities of the group being observed. Instead, he or she is usually seated at the sidelines observing the action of the group. This means that the researcher is not directly involved in the situation he or she is observing. Number three, naturalistic observation. This method, which is commonly used by psychologists and other social science researchers, requires that the researcher observes the subject under study in their natural setting. Here, the researcher simply observes and records what is really happening as they occur naturally. Lastly, number four, simulations. In this method, the researcher simulates or recreates a situation, environment, or system and observes the subjects under study in the simulated environment. The researcher may ask the participants to portray a role individually or by team. However, simulation does not guarantee that the participants' behavior in the simulated environment would be the same in the natural environment. That's it! Observations are important tools in qualitative research. Why is that? Amazing response! It is because they bring out and record the actual and authentic behavior as it happens in the actual setting. Have you taken notes of what we discussed about observations? Good job then! You certainly are research enthusiasts! What about interview? Have you experienced conducting an interview? Have you tried interviewing someone? I bet you have! As I've mentioned earlier, when conducting surveys, you may also apply both interview and observation. Why is interview done in the conduct of a research study? Awesome! Interview is done to validate the information you have recorded in your observation. This is considered as one of the most important data collection strategies in qualitative research. Are you aware that there are four types of interview? What do you think they are? Well, the four types of interview are structured, semi-structured, informal, and retrospective. Let's differentiate each type, structured and semi-structured. Interviews are verbal questionnaires. In structured interviews, the researcher has a specific set of questions designed to elicit responses from the participants, while in semi-structured interviews, the researcher prepares open-ended questions in which the participants are free to write their responses. On the other hand, informal interview is done to determine how the participants act on certain situations. This is casual conversation and conducted without specific sequence of questions or form of questioning. Retrospective interview is done to recall and reconstruct something that happened in the past. What kind of questions should you ask your respondents? Listen up learners! This is a crucial part of the interview process and there are six types of interview questions identified by Patton. Number one, background questions. These are questions about the background of the participants which include the education, age, previous work, and the like. Number 2. Knowledge Questions This refer to participants' factual information like asking the participants about school information such as rules or activities. Number 3. Experience Questions 
These are focused on what the participant is doing presently or in the past. For example, if I were attending your practices in the gym, what experiences would I be likely to see you having? Number four, opinion questions. These are asked to elicit how the participants think on certain topics or issues and aim to get the participants' values, beliefs, and attitude. For example, what do you think about the implementation of the K-12 curriculum? Number five, feeling questions. This pertain to the emotional responses of the participants in their experiences. For example, how do you feel when you solve a mathematics problem? Number six, sensory questions. This focus on what the respondent has seen, tasted, heard, touched, or smelled. For example, when you enter the room, what did you hear? Did you list down those interview tips? Yes, ma'am! That's the right attitude, dear learners! Always remember, interviews can help verify and validate data collected from the observation. Therefore, the type of question asked in interviews should be carefully chosen. I think you're ready now to present your research proposal. Before you do that, let us recall first the components of a research proposal. Can you tell me the three chapters that comprise your research proposal? Let's enumerate then. Chapter 1. We have the problem and its background which presents the problem. Significance, scope, and the limitation. And some terms that need to be defined in your study. For Chapter 2 or Review of Related Literature, it discusses the literature and studies related to your present study, which forms the theoretical and conceptual basis of your research. For Chapter 3 or the Methodology of Research, it presents the qualitative research approach that you will use, including the sample and the strategy for collecting and analyzing data. What we discussed earlier and from weeks 1 and 2 are the methods and procedures that are being indicated in this chapter. It seems that you are now equipped, my dear research enthusiasts. Nevertheless, after you have written your research proposal, the next phase of your work is to present orally your research proposal to a panel of experts. The panel is usually composed of three to five members who are experts in the discipline. Did you know that this usually makes researchers nervous? But as long as you follow the correct steps in coming up with a research proposal, you can never go wrong. Now, I will give you some recommendations to be undertaken before and during the presentation of your research proposal. Ready? I know you always are. So, for number one, always consult your research advisor. Your advisor will not only help you improve the content of your research proposal, he or she may also give you suggestions on how to defend your paper. Number two, study your proposal carefully. Expect questions that may be asked by the panel about your paper and prepare to answer each. Number 3. Prepare a PowerPoint presentation of your proposal in bullet form. Focus the content of your presentation on the research problem and the methods you will use to answer the specific research questions. Number 4. Usually, the allotted time for the proposal is 10 to 15 minutes to give more time for questions. Thus, summarize your proposal in a few slides. Number 5. During the question and answer, refrain from arguing with the panel of experts. Consider their comments and feedbacks as suggestions to improve your study. Number 6. Record the suggestions of the panel. This will help you in revising, finalizing your proposal. You can ask someone to write down the suggestions of the panel for you. Number 7. 
Be confident with a true heart. The defense is not meant to grill you, but to help you improve and finalize the direction of your research study. Lastly, number 8. Follow the dress code. The proposal defense is often a formal activity. Thus, schools set certain dress codes during such occasions. Be sure you know this before the schedule of your defense. That's it! I think you're now ready to present your research proposal. Just bear in mind everything that we discussed today. To wrap up what we learned today, can you enumerate the important terms that you have written down? Wow! You never cease to amaze me learners! Our big words for this episode are research instrument, data collection, data collection procedure, data analysis procedure, survey, observation interview, observation, interview, and the research proposal. I hope that after this learning adventure, you'll find time to review your notes because in essence, the tips and recommendations I have presented to you will help much in writing an effective research proposal. Ready for a short exercise? I know you are, so be prepared because I'll be back to tickle your brains after this brief reminder. Elena, Elena, have you washed your hands already? Oh yes, Karen, me too. We need to always wash our hands with soap and water to kill germs and bacteria and to keep us away from COVID-19. You're right, Elena. Proper hand washing is a protection against COVID-19. This information is from the Department of Health, Department of Education, and this is Stacia. Back to you, research enthusiasts! Prepare your notebooks and pen because your task is to listen carefully as I read twice the statements. Then, write the letter that corresponds to each item. Here we go! Number 1. These are instruments that you will use in the study such as surveys, observations, and interviews. Letter A. Research instrument. Letter B. Data collection procedures. Letter C. Data analysis procedures. And letter D. Research proposal. I repeat. Number 1. These are instruments that you will use in studies such as surveys, observations, interviews. Letter A. Research instruments. Letter B. Data collection procedures. Letter C. Data analysis procedures. And letter D. Research proposal. Number 2. These are specific steps you will undergo in order to collect data for your study. Letter A. Research instruments. Letter B. Data collection. Letter C. Data analysis procedures. Letter D. Research proposal. I repeat number 2, these are specific steps you will undergo in order to collect data for your study. Letter A, Research Instruments. Letter B, Data Collection Procedures. Letter C, Data Analysis Procedures. And Letter D, Research Proposal. Number 3, this describe how you will analyze the data that you will gather. Letter A, Research Instruments. Letter B, Data Collection Procedures. Letter C, Data Analysis Procedures. And Letter D, Research Proposals. I repeat number 3. This describe how you will analyze the data that you will gather. Letter A, Research Instruments. Letter B, Data Collection Procedures. Letter C, Data Analysis Procedures. Letter D, Research Proposal. Number 4. It presents the first three chapters of a research paper where you face a panel of experts. Letter A, Research Instruments. Letter B, Data Collection Procedures. Letter C, Data Analysis Procedures. And Letter D, Research Proposal. 
Again, number four, it presents the first three chapters of a research paper where you face a panel of experts. Letter A, research instruments. Letter B, data collection procedures. Letter C, data analysis procedures. And letter D, research proposal. Number five, in what chapter will you find the ways and means in order to collect data for your study? Letter A, chapter one. Letter B, Chapter 2, Letter C, Chapter 3, and Letter D, Chapter 4. Again, Number 5. In what chapter will you find the ways and means in order to collect data for your study? Letter A, Chapter 1, Letter B, Chapter 2, Letter C, Chapter 3, and Letter D, Chapter 4. Time's up! Are you done answering? Well, keep your answers because we'll see how will you listen when we check them in our next episode. In case of clarifications, feel free to reach out to your subject teachers. That's all for today, learners! On behalf of the script writer, Mr. Arnel D. Rabaha, together with the whole RBI production team, I am your radio teacher, teacher Emma Luisa Marzan Fernando, saying, learning is precious and so is your life. Stay home, stay safe. Goodbye! Patuloy! Patuloy ang edukasyon para sa ating generasyon. Sa daan ng pagkatuto ay walang may iwan. Kaya halina sa Radyo! Radyo! Radyo Eskwela!